A simple act of kindness found me. A simple act of kindness saved me. A simple act of kindness brought me home. Well, I don't know if you could see there was a soul inside of me. If not for the kindness of a friend Well maybe now you couldn't tell But I'd be just an empty shell If not for the kindness human heart can be out there I was so far gone I thought that no one ever could see me I would be a lost and broken man if it weren't for the reaching of a It wasn't all that long ago I would have thrown away my soul If not for the kindness of a friend Well now and then I feel the sting Of almost losing everything If not for the along what someone gave to me a simple act of kindness found me a simple act of kindness saved me
whatever. <laughs> they want to push on. All right, so John writes to answer what is the real question, and he boils it all down to three things. The real thing is to believe Jesus, obey Jesus, and love people. Turns out that one of the three marks of the real thing is love for people. Jesus says, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Love is the real thing in following Christ. So I'd like you to turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 7. There are Bibles under the seats. We're going to focus on one of those three marks today, love. Uh, you may be surprised to learn that love is not something you either have or you don't have. You can give or you can't give. It's not like, you know, you're either a loving person or an unloving person. You're an outgoing person or you're reserved. Uh, you can learn to love. John tells us some ways we can learn to love in 1 John 2 and 3. Would you stand in honor of the Holy Spirit who inspired John to write this? 1 John 2, 7, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one which you have read, which you have had since the beginning. The old command is the message you have heard. Uh, the Old Testament Jesus sums up with, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and shall love others as yourself. Uh, so love is not new. Yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in Him. So the newness of this command is that it's based in Jesus. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they're going because the darkness has blinded them. 1 John 3.11, for this is the message you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with action and truth. Lord Jesus, teach us today. You inspired John to write this. Help us understand how to love. We all have people in our lives who have a difficult time loving. We all have people in our lives we need to love better. Teach us how we can do that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. John asks, what's the real thing? And he says, you love people. John identifies at least five ways you can learn to love. One, get rid of the love killers. One of the love killers is the darkness of hate. 1 John 2, 9, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there's nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going because the darkness has blinded them. Another love killer is the death of anger and judgmentalism. 1 John 3.12, Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life. John says, you may claim to know Christ, but if you hate people, you're still in the darkness. You're still in death. Failure to love people does not mean you're not a Christ follower. But if you expect non-believers to know you are a Christian, you must show love. John says that Jesus 
uh, gives the world the right to conclude whether or not we're Christians by the love we extend to other people. Jesus says, by this will everyone know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus says to the world, based on my authority, I give you the right to judge whether or not a person is a Christian by whether they love other people. If a non-believer comes into our church and they find us uh, bickering and fighting and divided into factions, they have the right to conclude that we're not followers of Christ. Now, the church uses another test to determine who is a Christian. We use doctrine. The primary way we decide who is the real thing is by asking, what do you believe? But we cannot expect the world to use that measurement. Now, the world doesn't care what people believe. Our culture thinks that people can believe whatever they want to believe. Our day has abandoned belief in absolute truth. And when all truth is relative, no one cares what you believe. But when people see us loving people, then they sit up and take notice. Verse 9 of chapter 2, anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Uh, the word for brother uh, John uses is the Greek word adelphos. Adelphos does not just refer to brothers or sisters in Christ, but it refers to the brotherhood of mankind. So it's all people. So we are called to love all people because all people are made in God's image. So if the world sees us not loving any person in this world of any kind, they have reason to conclude that we're not Christians. Verse 11, but anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. When we hate people or judge people, we relinquish the evidence that we are Christians. When non-believers are asked, what do you think about Christians? One of the first words that comes from their mouths is judgmental. They feel judged by us. Why do we judge people in the world? I think it's because we don't understand the Bible and our role in the world. Although some of the teachings in the Bible are for all human beings, many of the teachings in the Bible are for God's people, people who have come into a relationship with God through Christ. And then there are all these directions for how you ought to live as a follower of Christ. But these commands are not for people in the world who have not signed any contract with Jesus. Yet often we judge people for not keeping the commands that were never intended for them. Uh, let me explain it this way. I never go to my neighbor's house and tell their kids what to do. You know, I don't say, did you practice your piano? Uh, did you finish your homework? Uh, did you hit the weight room after school today? Uh, make sure you're in bed by 9 p.m.? I mean, come on. It's none of my business. I don't ever call up my neighbor and say, hey, Bill, uh, can I talk to Josh? I, I told Josh that he needed to practice his math flashcards and I'm just checking. Hello? You don't tell your neighbor's kids what to do. And if you've ever tried, you know it doesn't work out too well. Why? Because they're not your kids. Now, somewhere along the line, the church got all confused about this. They opened their Bibles and they began to read uh, what God wants us to do. They uh, made a commitment to Christ and, and, and re recognized that Jesus shed his precious blood for us. So in response, we want to live holy lives. Then we looked up and we saw non-believers and we said, you're not doing very good at following these commands. So we judged them. I mean, one of the reasons you stopped going to church is because you felt judged by people in the church. It made you feel very unaccepted. The reason many church people are judgmental is because they don't understand the Bible. Here's what the Bible teaches. And if you get anything out of this message this morning, grab this one. Jesus says, do not judge the New Testament teaches that Christians are not to judge non-believers. Because it's the same as me trying to tell my ki neighbors, kids, what to do. It's none of my business what, my, what the neighbor's kids do. 
And in the same way, Christ followers have no right to judge the behavior of people outside the faith because they're not keeping commands that were never intended for them. Because many, possibly most, of the commands in the Bible are for people in a relationship with God through Christ. We're not to judge people. We're to get rid of the love killers like judgmentalism and hate. A second way you can learn to love is to sacrifice yourself for others. 316, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Love in the New Testament is all about looking at Jesus and doing the same thing he did. Jesus sacrificed his life for us, so we are to sacrifice our lives for other people. Two weeks ago, my son Joel and I went to see the movie 13 Hours. We were interested in going to it because the whole story about what happened in Benghazi when Ambassador Stevens was killed, why was he not protected? It's like a black hole in our nation's history. It's the story of six highly decorated soldiers who were there to protect Ambassador Stevens and all the CIA personnel. They were outnumbered like 150 to 6 or maybe 200 to 6. They did an incredible job. They got all the CIA personnel out of Libya and safely home. But three of them lost their lives in the process. They sacrificed their lives for the CIA personnel. Three made it home. And they wrote down their story of what happened in Benghazi. And it became, became the movie. Now you may not be called upon to sacrifice your life. But you can live with an attitude of sacrificing yourself. For people you sacrifice your time, your rights, your money to serve others. Joseph Michelli, in his book, The New Gold Standard, tells about the amazing staff at the Ritz-Carlton Hotels. They are an amazing staff, and the uh, Ritz-Carlton has been voted the number one luxury hotel for many years because they're empowered. If a staff person sees a hotel guest with a problem, they're empowered to deal with it. They don't have to ask up the management chain for permission. And they can spend up to $2,000 on a hotel guest, making it right. So one person they served is a 12-year-old girl named Natalie uh, Salazar. She was a uh, championship figure skater uh, headed toward the Olympics. And she was uh, going to regional uh, championship and uh, she had pain in her leg. She assumed it was inflammation, but uh, when she got it checked, she found out it was cancer. Uh, osteosarcoma chemotherapy failed and so at age 13 the doctors told her you're going to die one of her greatest regrets was that she would never get to go to her high school prom so her 8th grade teacher went to the same church as Laura Guterres uh, the uh, director of human resources at the Dearborn Ritz Carlton and when Laura heard about that she and her staff flew into action they were going to make a prom for Natalie like none other. They invited 25 of her classmates and seven of her championship uh, figure skating cham uh, teammates. Their audiovisual guy became the disc jockey. Their IT tech guy became the photographer. Uh, their business editor put on a PowerPoint presentation of uh, Natalie's life and her friends from kindergarten all the way through eighth grade, including a uh, picture she had drawn uh, that they got from her kindergarten teacher. It was a wonderful evening. It began with uh, Prince Charming walking her down a red carpet to the dance floor. The uh, convention center team had put a, up pin lights and laid down a dance floor. And walk, uh, Prince Charming walked her down to one of her favorite songs, Sweet Escapes. She danced the night away with Prince Charming. She had a wonderful time. She had a smile on her face the whole night. She had her favorite food, salami, cheese, vegetables, ice cream. She hula hooped. She hustled. She chicken danced. She led the train around the dance floor. 
Parents came at 10.30 just before Prince Charming turned back into a frog. Kids had such a great time. Nobody wanted to say goodbye. After tearful goodbyes, Natalie got in her carriage to be taken home for some much-needed rest. On the way home, she says, tomorrow I'm going to the hospital for tests and I'm going to tell everybody how it went tonight. And she sure did. There was a buzz around the hotel because the people felt like they'd really helped somebody. They'd really helped a family. Natalie's father said, you know, we're immigrants here. We don't have any family. But Laura's teacher and the Rich Carlton staff, they showed love to us like they were our own family. September 20th, 2007, Natalie lost the battle with cancer. The Ritz Carlton staff person who made her dress for the prom also made her dress in which she was laid to rest. The Ritz Carlton community made sacrifices to serve Natalie. Jesus is our example. He sacrificed his life for us. If we want to love people, think, what can I sacrifice to serve this person? A third way you can learn to love is to love in response to Jesus. 316, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. We love people because Jesus loves us. 419, we love because he first loved us. This is so important to understand. Love is not something we do with gritted teeth. I'm going to love if it kills me. No, we love out of joy because we are loved by Jesus. We love in response to Jesus. I mean, this is the heart of the good news. Uh, the gospel is called good news, right? What's the good news? The good news is the great God who created this beautiful universe that we see today loves us so much that he sent his son to die for us. He is so good to us. He loves us. And because we are loved, it's our joy to love others. We don't love to earn God's favor. We love in response to it. A fourth way you can learn to love is to make love a verb. 317, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. We're not just to talk about love. Love is something we do. We do something practical. John talks about love in terms of something one does rather than what something someone feels. How different this is from what we're taught in our culture. Uh, we talk about falling in love. A guy and gal meet and pretty soon they tell us they are in love. A guy and gal get married because they are in love. They're deliriously happy because they have the in love feelings. But what happens when times get tough and those in love feelings die? What happens when one partner feels like the other partner not pulling his or her weight? What happens when we adopt our culture's protocols? Do unto others as they do unto you. Isn't that kind of how we see it? Do unto others as they deserve to be done unto. Isn't that kind of the way we do it? These fragile relational contracts leave these parties focused on the behavior of the other person. The relationship is built on mutual distrust. You're not feeling the love, so you figure you're not giving the love. Some couples believe that the end of the in love experience means that they're left with only two options. One, live a lifetime of misery, or two, cut your losses and try again. But there's a better way. Make love a verb. 3.11, for this is the message you've heard from the beginning. We should love one another. He got it from Jesus. A new command I give you, love one another. Jesus com didn't command us to feel in love. He commanded us to do some things. And he took it a step further. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. He said, do unto others as I have done unto you. You see, when I love you the way you love me, 
My love is conditional. I am engaging, I'm gauging my love on how well you love me. But if I love you the way Jesus loves me, your response to my love becomes almost inconsequential. I'm not doing unto you as you do unto me. I'm doing unto you as Jesus has done unto me. You see, when love is a verb, I can choose to love out of obedience to Christ based on how much Jesus loves me. I don't have to feel in love in order to love. I can love you unconditionally. That's good news for a married couple who feels like their in love experience has died. If love is a verb, then they have a choice to love even after the in love feelings are gone. Which leads to the final way you can learn to love. This one may disarm you. Love is impossible. This is an extremely important secret about love. The secret is you cannot manufacture unconditional love out of your own heart. It's impossible. You're not capable of it. None of us is. So if you say, I can't love my wife, I can't love my husband, I can't love my son, I can't love my daughter, I can't love my mom. I can't love my dad. I can't love my coworker. I can't love my classmate after all she's done. You know something? You're right. You cannot make love a verb and love unconditionally. You can't give what you don't have. Just as you can't give away a million dollars if you don't have a million dollars, you can't love, pay out love in greater measure than you own. Only God can do it. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. You cannot love others unconditionally without depending on Jesus' love flowing through you. You cannot, unless you invite Jesus into your life and depend on your, his strength, you'll never be able to love people the way you need to. You cannot love your way out of a relational disaster without depending on Jesus' unconditional love coursing through you. You can learn to love. You can learn to love because love is not just a feeling. It's not a deal where you can give love if you have that I'm in love feeling. And you can't if you don't. You can love because love is a verb. It's a choice but you can't do it by drumming up love from within yourself. You can love by depending on Christ's love working through you. Lord Jesus, thank you for inspiring John to write this. Such good advice on such an important thing. We all need to love people. We all have people that we really can't love We want to learn to love. So I want to give you a chance to respond to God. If, would you bow your head and pray with me? And would you just tell God how you want to respond to him today? Maybe you want to tell him, hey, there's somebody in my life. I just can't. This guy is so bad. I'm so angry with him. I want to get away from that hatred, that judgmentalism, and I want to love him. Help me. Maybe you're hanging on a, by a thread with your marriage. You say, I want to make love a verb and begin to love unconditionally regardless of the response. Or maybe you've never committed your life to Christ. First step would be to say, Jesus, I want you in my life and I'm going to depend on your love working in me. You invite him in right now. Would you just pray silently? Lord Jesus, thank you for hearing our prayers. Thank you that you love us. And if we depend on your love, we can love others unconditionally. That's great news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.